first of all, thank you for taking the time to speak to us. Um, my very first question would be, how do you see yourself? How do you see your profession? What would you s call yourself? A re-speaker, a subtitler, a live subtitler? I would call myself a speech-to-text interpreter because this combines uh, both points of view. So it's interpreting uh, both intra as interlingually and also the conversion from speech to text. Um, what type of intra or interlingual live subtitling or speech to text interpreting do you do? What are your contexts and the genres you work with? I've been doing every type of contexts up to now, scientific, one political, one social, one events, uh, international conferences. There's re really no limit. And do you work only intralingually or also interlingually? I do both, but mainly intralingually. How long have you been doing this and for how, oh, how often do you do it? Uh, inter or intra? So I've been doing intralingual um, speech uh, to text interpreting since 2014 and I do it uh, almost on a daily basis and uh, speech to text uh, interlingually uh, I've been, been doing this for a little bit more than a year and last year I had nine complete days for uh, English to German and uh, some little assignments, three or four, uh, just so one hour um, assignments. It's already a lot for Austrian standards, I think. Mm. I have not been doing it in, in, in Austria, but in Germany and in Brussels. Mm. Mm. Makes more sense. <laughs> <laughs> um, regarding interlingual, uh, live subtitling, you've already said you work with it, but how big is the demand and what do you think, how big is it going to be in the short to medium term? The demand has just started a little bit more than a year ago in the German speaking area and uh, I think there will be a big increase of the demand. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, what do you think, is it feasible to provide high quality interlingual live subtitling for all of the contexts and genres that we already use intralingual live subtitling for? Uh, basically yes, um, but what I see is that the cognitive load is a lot higher than for intralingual um, speech to text interpreting um, and uh, there are a lot of details that you have to account for. Such details uh, could be, for example, shorter shifts, um, uh, two to three in a team, um, very good preparation material. Yeah, that's mainly the, the prerequisites for it. Mm -hmm. You said two to three in a team. Do you mean just uh, speech to text interpreters, or would there also be other people involved, like editors? Um, the third person could even be an editor, yeah. Um, do you assess the quality of your interlingual live subtitling or interlingual speech to text interpreting? And if yes, how is it different compared to the, your, <laughs> your quality assessment of interlingual live subtitling? Um, up to now I only do ex post um, reviewing, not a really quali real quality assessment as I haven't had the possibility to uh, record the um, uh, source uh, text. I, uh, I don't do um, assessment in the proper sense up to now. I just do a reviewing, an ex post reviewing. Uh, especially when I uh, re-edit um, the target text um, because there, up to now there was no possibility to record the source text. Mm -hmm. So there is not no real possibility to compare it. Let's continue with the training aspect. How were you trained, if at all, 
was it at university? Um, did you teach yourself? Did you get in-house training? Um, for interlingual live subtitling, there is no training available in uh, the German-speaking area. But I am a conference interpreter. I've got a master's degree in it. And uh, I made the vocational training, uh, two-semester training for speech or text interpreting. So I just combined the, the, the inputs of the two studies and for interlingual life subtitling, as you call it, or speech to text interpreting, as I call it. Um, I just combine the knowledge of both. That makes sense. <laughs> what skills do you think are required to become a good interlingual life subtitler or interlingual speech to text interpreter? Mm, basically, for becoming a good interlingual life subtitler or speech to text interpreter, you need uh, to have uh, both the translational skills, speech to text conversion skills. So you have to be able f um, for a good mu multitasking, uh, you have to um, have a good uh, mm, cognition and fast cognition, a good listening comprehension, and um, you have to have also some uh, manual skills, as often you have to correct uh, immediately after appearing the target text. There, may, there are many reasons for it. So the speech uh, recognition doesn't work well, or you, your dictation was not OK, so you have to correct. So your ear, eye, and hand uh, coordination has to be very um, Mm, very mm, developed. Um, what else? Um, yeah, mm. just combining the, the the skills of both. Mm. Yeah, I want to add that you had you also have to know about uh, you have to know a lot about culture of the deaf and hard of hearing. So how they understand and how they read and how they perceive because uh, interlingual life subtitling is not only for the deaf and hard of hearing, but it is the main uh, target audience. Um, in your experience, is there a particularly suitable background or profile for um, a interlingual life subtitler? Well, I think um, a typical profile would be uh, conference interpreters trained in speech to text interpreting. This would be the ideal one. And was I'm a trainer for uh, speech to text interpreting, and my best uh, students are always uh, interpreters and and translators. So you don't think that um, trained subtitlers can reach the same level as fast? I think this depends very much on the individual um, skills. Mm -hmm. What kind of training program would you recommend? What are prerequisites that the students need? Um, what would you? What subjects would you have? How long would it take? Um, for me, one of the most important things uh, as a prerequisite is a aptitude test. So you have to check uh, how is the this, um, language knowledge, um, what kind of multitasking are they able to do, how is the manual uh, um, ability, how fast can they type, because even if you do uh, uh, speech recognition, you have to type a lot. And I see, not sometimes, but very often, that some colleagues that are really good uh, re-speakers are very bad typers. So if there uh, appears, for example, um, a proper name uh, that obviously is not trained in the speech recognition software, so you have to type it and then uh, and see really how they type with the two-finger system. And this is very important. So um, we use as an aptitude test, for example, a minimum 300 uh, keystrokes per minute uh, to uh, for the admission for the speech-to-text um, um, vocational training of two semesters. Um, so these are the prerequisites from the, uh, to have an aptitude test. And then I think a minimum two semester um, course is needed, uh, not only to train, but only to settle the knowledge and to, to fine tune it. 
um, I would do most of it in uh, 80 90% in face-to-face -face courses but uh, in a later stadium of the course there's um, obviously uh, the possibility to make um, a, a webinar session um, giving them um, for example um, exercises to do and they send uh, them to uh, to you while so you explain them uh, you have you, you tell them what they have to um, uh, take care especially uh, for in this special um, exam or um, exercise then they send you the target text uh, by email you can assess it while they do the next one so this is all also saving time and then you have, can give them feedback um, individually or all together uh, at the end of this of the webinar session this is also possible but I personally think it's very important that you go around and you see how it works uh, where are the um, strengths and um, and um, shortcomings of each person um, by applying the speech recognition software when it's now really the practical thing. For me, it's also very important to combine the scientific and the practical issue. So uh, s um, interpreting strategies, for example, is a very uh, big um, topic, an important topic. And also um, what Albel Mikasa calls the power process, so all the organizational things, because most of us, um, I think about 80-90% work as independent uh, speech or text interpreters. So you have to organize yourself. You, ha you have to know how to do acquis acquisition, You know uh, how to do um, um, invoicing, etc., etc. So it's a very uh, complex set of skills that you have to learn, mm -hmm. not just the use of the speech recognition in se, uh, per se. Mm -hmm. What do you think, uh, what kind of training material is useful for training interlingual lapse of tightening or issue text? The training material uh, for me would be a blended one from simultaneous interpreting and speech to text interpreting. So uh, the only thing that I uh, would recommend is to recategorize if you use the audios, for example, from SCIC. Uh, you have to recategorize uh, the difficulty because uh, some audios that for in simultaneous interpreting are easy or beginner style for speech to text interpreting uh, are very um, challenging and at the beginning I would say in the first half of the course you have to produce some audios for the um, for the exercises um, in order uh, so f for not frustrating mm -hmm. the candidates this is for the practical things and uh, if you go to interlingual life subtitling i would start with intralingual and only uh, when the intralingual uh, use of the speech recognition is um, on a good level I would add this additional um, cognitive effort of translating and uh, par uh, parallel in parallel I would train them in simultaneous interpreting. Do you think there should be different things taken into account when training the interlingual live subtitlers according to the different contexts? Um, for example, TV, education, or live events? Yes, of course. Um, in TV, obviously, you have uh, the, the whole subtitling issue, the 37 characters per line. Uh, some uh, broadcasters use different colors, others don't. Uh, all the, all, everything that has to do with the presentation on screen in TV is quite different from uh, the other settings. Um, in uh, education, for example, it would be very important to know uh, or to create a sensitivity for how much um, speech or yeah, uh, yeah, language, a spoken language or written language, thus uh, the um, 
the person who you are, you, who you are interpreting for uh, able to understand. Because it is, is it if it's a deaf person, uh, so in our case, German would be a second language, not the mother tongue. And therefore, you might uh, use a completely different form of speech to text interpreting. So you would condense more, you would uh, reformulate, you would uh, segment uh, into short sentences. Maybe you would sometimes explain some uh, special words. Um, it depends. There is a big um, range, um, a scope, a, a wide scope of uh, possibilities um, that you have to make yourself understood as a speech to text interpreter, especially in the educational setting. And uh, in the educational setting, it's also very important to have a very high correctness, so grammatical and orthographic, because otherwise the student would learn um, a wrong, um, wrong words or a wrong grammatic. Uh, where, whereas in uh, live events such as conferences, there's maybe not such a problem if there is some orthographic um, or s spelling error um, and it's more important to transfer the, the, the content. So you have, uh, you have to tell the people, uh, the, the course participants, for example, uh, what is the exercise be, uh, meant for? For TV, for um, a big audience uh, in a live event, or a um, uh, educational setting or another one that is also very important is um, the um, at, at, at the doctors so there you have if you don't um, understand a word or uh, some uh, technical terminus as a te technical term you have to ask the um, doctor to repeat in order to write it in the correct way because this could have very um, uh, important co uh, consequences uh, so you have to you have to know in which situation uh, you are doing uh, interlingual life subtitling uh, or intralingual both and um, you have to know for whom if it is one special person or a group of homogeneous, heterogeneous uh, persons, um, sorry, heterogeneous or homogeneous group, or an, um, just an audience uh, that you don't know. So this changes a lot. Yeah. All right, just two or three questions to conclude now. Do you have any opinion or would you like research in interlingual subtitling focus on something special? Inter or intra? Inter. Um, I think any kind of research at the moment is uh, useful because there is very little. Um, but one thing I would like to be studied is when there is a reason for interlingual life subtitling um, instead of doing relay from simultaneous interpreting. Because, of course, uh, interlingual life subtitling or interlingual speech interpreting means a lot higher uh, cognitive load than just uh, simultaneous interpreting that per se um, has a high in cognitive load to to manage, and um, I would think that the quality of interpreting the, of simultaneous interpreting is higher than the quality of an interlingual life subtitling. And uh, there's another thing we have to take into account. We don't want to cannibalize our uh, other. Um, um, professions. So I had already the case that somebody just wanted to economize, uh, just to save money on uh, in simultaneous interpreting and uh, so do it uh, directly from speech to text interlingually and I denied, I didn't accept this assignment 
because it was a special case where I thought it would be a lot better to have a simultaneous interpretation and uh, taking relay because this was not kind of a, a talk show or something or a panel discussion where it is very important to have it immediately. So um, obviously the big um, advantage of interlingual live subtitling is the immediateness, so uh, a, sm a very short delay. Um, and there are some situations where it would be almost nonsense to do a simultaneous in interpreting plus um, taking relay for for speech to text but you have to be very very careful and i think uh, research would be very interesting in terms of where where is it better to have simultaneous interpreting plus uh, speech to text or interlingual speech to text this is something that maybe has not been thought about yet. Yeah, that's a good point. And where do you think the professional practice of interlingual life subtitling is going? And is there anything we should bear in mind regarding training? Uh, <laughs> quality, as, <laughs> as always. Um, I think it would be very important to stress on quality uh, over quantity uh, because it's a very new profession and if there are um, non-professionals or low-quality professionals doing a lot of interlingual life subtitling, the profession per se would suffer, I think, and the image would suffer uh, before an image even has been built this is for me this is the most important thing yeah um, all right do you have anything else you want to say any recommendations for the ilsa team yep um, maybe uh, keep in mind that uh, there are not every day but let's say every year new players on the scene so just uh, investigate uh, research on where new educations courses trainings are appearing uh, to to put them into the pot so to say and uh, um, have a look what what, what is the um, actual development for example there's a, a new uh, vocational training that combines scientific and practical training in Innsbruck that just uh, um, finished the, the first um, training course with very, very good results. And uh, there is a postgraduate uh, postgraduate training course being planned in Vienna at the University of Vienna. And uh, I think this is only what is happening in Austria, but um, I think there is a lot of development going on. So uh, keep uh, keep the eyes open and, and, and take uh, the others in the, also into your uh, scripts that you already have just adding them sounds very good we'll try to bear that in mind right thank you so much for your time welcome <laughs>